Good morning, everybody in Hungary. We have a guest we are looking for since five years. So it took five years to talk to, to be able to talk to him. But at last, he's here. Pim Dimor from Corporate Rebels. Hey, Pim. Hi. Good morning. Good to be here. Nice to see you. I wanted to talk to you so much because basically what you say about yourself, your journey is very, very similar to mine. Can you explain a little bit how you got into this whole thing? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes. So I, uh, let me briefly share a little bit about my uh, my background. Um, I studied uh, industrial engineering um, quite some time ago, and um, after I graduated, I started to work for a company that did exactly the thing that I had studied for. So I went to work for them, had a really good time in terms of the work I was doing. So the content of the work I really enjoyed. But after a couple of years, I started to realize that the way of working and the way the organization was structured was really not something that was very interesting to me. So there was a boss who was telling me what to do. There was no freedom. You could not make your own decisions. You always had to go up to people uh, somewhere higher up in the hierarchy for the, uh, so they could make decisions for you. There wasn't any entrepreneurship. So it was quite a boring work environment. Um, and I became a bit frustrated. Uh, luckily, I wasn't the only one and a good friend of mine, Joost, he experienced the same problem in a different company. Um, he started nanotechnology, so something totally different and started also to work in that field, doing the thing he loved, but also feeling the frustration of the way of working of the company. So we got together, shared our frustration, and after a couple of beers, we decided that we were not going to continue doing this for 40 more years. And we couldn't, because we were complaining so much and we th said, well, if we continue working in such environments, we will probably continue complaining as well for 40 more years. And we didn't really want to do that. So we decided at that moment to, to quit our jobs and to start looking for companies, academics, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and other people and organizations that could teach us something about creating better workplaces. And we had heard about companies where they had no managers, where they had... Um, organize themselves in forms of self-management where there was a strong purpose towards where the organizations was was working towards so there were all these things that we heard about and we couldn't picture working in an environment like that because we had the complete opposite experience so we got together we said well let's let's look at these organizations and talk to these people to understand how they actually work different so that was actually what we started doing five years ago so we quit our jobs um, put our clothes in a backpack and started to travel around the world to visit these organizations to see with our own eyes how they were actually doing things differently. And that's what we've been doing more or less for five years. So we've been traveling to more than 120 of these organizations to learn how they work, to interview people at the top, at the bottom, all over the place uh, to understand how they work, but also to talk to academics and CEOs and entrepreneurs to really get a good understanding of how work can be organized differently. And we write about everything we do on our blog, which is um, available for people twice a week. Um, and, and after that, many more things um, um, came from it. Um, so it's been much more uh, than what we started five years ago, obviously. But uh, uh, the, the thing we, we do, the thing we focus on is making work more fun. Because we believe if you spend 40 hours a week working, you should also be enjoying that time and using your talents to contribute to something that you truly believe in. And unfortunately, not a lot of people experience that in today's workplaces. So there is a solution. So, so tell us a little bit about that. And I know maybe it's a, it's more of a recap because you are writing about these things a, a long, long time since, but but just let's 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 talk a little bit about that. And and the question is, is there one one new way of working, or there are many new ways of doing work differently? Well, five years ago, we set out to find the one golden uh, solution. So this, this ideal way of working that could fit in every, every work environment. But after just a couple of months and a couple of visits to organizations, we pictured or we learned that that was not a possibility. Things were so different in every organization. It depended so heavily on the context, on the, the types of people working in those companies and what they were doing and where they were based and what kind of culture they already had. So unfortunately, there's not a one size fits all solution. Um, if probably if that would have been the case, a lot more organizations would have already adopted it. But it's harder than that. So you have to really find a specific way of working that fits your 
specific organization. But there are, of course, overall themes that are uh, common between these organizations and between these ways of working. So if you talk about giving people more freedom, more autonomy, you have to let go of quite a lot of rules and procedures and protocols in your company. You have to let go of the strict hierarchies in which many companies still work. You have to find a way to inspire people to contribute to something they truly believe in and to find a way for your organization to do something more than just making money for shareholders. So there, there are these common themes um, that we've seen across the globe, whatever culture, um, whatever type of organization, where they could create environments where people could really flourish and be highly motivated at work by giving them some of these things. And in our, in our book and in our blog posts, we, we, we write about the eight trends and these are kind of the overarching eight themes that we see in these companies. It's, once again, it's not a one size fits all. So you might go to one company where you see seven of these trades and you might go to another company where you see five of these trends. So it's very different, but overall we see most of these trends in such organizations uh, very presently. Do you know, I, I've always uh, were thinking about maybe the common nom nominator or, uh, is, is, is honesty. Uh, because honesty miss, is missing in a large number of organizations and it's not necessarily outright lies. It's more, they don't talk about things honest in an honest way. So they are not really talking about, do we need an office or not? They're not talking about, are we really democratic or, or we just act like and do what the boss wants us to yeah. do. Or, you know, all these small things that are not so small, like intercompany relationships and, and all this stuff, they are just under the rug. Uh, oops, that was my Coke, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is bad because I wanted to drink it. Uh, it it's just under the rug. And, um, and people act as if they are not there, but they are there. And however nice employer branding uh, yeah. campaign you do, basically that's, that's not true. No, and I also hate the term employer branding. Um, I think it's a, um, a stupid thing to focus on for organizations. If you, because if you focus on employer branding, apparently you wanna create an image that isn't already there. Um, so you are going to kind of going to gloss over reality and you're going to show things that are maybe not that really that present in your organization. If you would focus all your effort of employer branding on creating a really um, inspiring culture in your organization, the people you're working with, so your employees, but also your customers and your suppliers, they will spread the word for you. If everybody knows that you have a excellent company culture, this will become known and you don't need any fancy employer branding campaigns for that. Uh, what you need to focus on is actually creating an environment where people love to work because otherwise you have this cool story for the outside world and a nice marketing campaign around it. And then you attract new people, they come to work for you. And then the first day they're in their office, they realize that um, the campaign was quite a bit different than reality. So I agree with you. Yeah, the honesty is super important and not just the honesty in um, what is our culture like and how can we express it to the outside world? but also internally. Uh, look at all the politics that are going on inside traditional organizations where people at the top are not transparent and open about the things that are truly happening. They're not open about financials of the company. They're not open about performance of everyone in the organization, but also the honesty on team level. It's really hard for people to be honest and give each other proper feedback. But if we want to work in a system where there are no managers telling us what to do or no managers who are solving the problems for us, then we also need to be very open and honest towards each other. And we need to learn to give proper and honest feedback so we can learn from each other and collaborate to achieve something that we could never achieve alone. Um, so I fully agree with you. This honesty is a super important trait, but it's also one of the hardest things to do, right? Um, I think in our culture, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands. So the Dutch people are known to be quite uh, direct and, and honest. Um, which can also have a lot of downsides if you go to other travel to other cultures. But I think if you look at organizations also here in the Netherlands, there are quite a few that are, have been able to transform and um, have been able to work very progressively because I think it fits our culture uh, quite nicely. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean it can't happen in other places because we've seen it all around the world. So, but yeah, I agree with you. This honesty is, is super important. So yes. So that's, that was the big trend before this epidemic. And so what do you think 
what is happening now, Pim, is this honesty more in focus is working really differently uh, now in focus or or we just moved from the office to home and we brought all the problems and all the behavior with us i think it depends on which company you're looking at but i think most companies are doing the exact same thing as they are doing uh, as they were doing before the pandemic but now doing it remotely so for, i know from a couple of friends who work in in organizations and they are now forced to work from home, just like the vast majority of us. Uh, but the thing is, they've not really like we've been visiting companies that have been working remotely for for years, sometimes for decades already, um, or at least partially. And they have changed their entire way of working as well. But if you look at now many organizations, if, if I look at some of uh, my friends, they now work from home, but they're doing the exact same thing. So from nine to five, they have back-to-back -back meetings every single day um, so they are not um, they haven't really changed their way of working they just changed to being behind a screen instead of in a meeting room still wasting a vast majority of their time um, on these these nonsensical things so I think many organizations should not just be looking at do we want to work remotely or do we want to work in the office or do we want to create a hybrid version of that um, because I think that depends on um, a lot of factors, a lot of uncertainties, and also especially on what it is that people actually want in the future. But what I think is more important to make people feel comfortable, whether they're working in the office or outside the office, is to rethink more of your ways of working. Do you need all of those meetings to get things done? Um, spoiler alert, the answer is, is no in most of the cases. Um, is there a better way to communicate? Can you do combine uh, your communication into asynchronous and synchronous? How can you best combine that for your specific organization? Um, so there, and also, for example, how do you make decisions? Um, is there another way to do that? Because now you're distributed in terms of location. Can you also distribute some decision making? So people feel more autonomy, feel more ownership while they are working abroad. Um, or while they're working outside the office. Also uh, looking at, for example, the uh, distribution of tasks. Can you also make changes in that? Can you, for example, move some of the tasks that are not traditionally done by a manager to people in the teams, to people closer to the front line? Um, it creates a lot less uh, bottlenecks in your organization, creates also a lot more entrepreneurship and ownership because people can really pick up the tasks that they are passionate about and also make decisions on that. So if you change more of these things than just a working location, you can achieve much greater benefits than um, organizations are achieving at the moment. Um, there's a lot to be done. And I think that's a perfect thing about this crisis. Like it has a lot of downsides, of course, um, and, and, and gives our societies a lot of problems. But at the same time, it's also a big opportunity to change. Like we are forced to make changes anyways. So why not use these changes to, to benefit from them in the best possible way? So I, any organization, whether it's in Netherlands or in Hungary, I think the main question should now be, how can we experiment with more ways of working than just our working location? How can we find a new approach to work that can benefit our employees, but also the organization itself? And I think these are vital questions to ask at the moment, especially before we go back into the normal way of working again. Tell us a few about of, of these stories because we, we heard we read a few like Frederick Lalo. I know that you, you are uh, also a big fan of him uh, and Birds Org, if I correctly pronounce it. And uh, no, no, Birds Org. Birds Org. Okay, <laughs> I've had always problem with Dutch. Yeah, it's challenging. Uh, and uh, and drinking a lot of beer did not help. <laughs> well, also, sometimes you actually speak more fluently when you had a bit of alcohol. Yeah, 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 but not on Dutch. Uh, <laughs> so, so tell us a few of, of, of the recent ones, or the ones that surprised you the most, or the you know the ones you would, would like to tell to the Hungarian uh, HR community. Yeah, that's a really interesting one that we discovered just a couple of months ago. It's a Russian company, uh, which I'm going to pronounce completely uh, wrong, probably um, something like Vgusville. Um, it's a supermarket uh, chain, and they employ now about 14,000 people. And they adopted some of the principles of Beardsorg, for example, or other progressive organizations. 
by distributing, distributing a lot of uh, decision-making power to the people working at the front line. So the people in their, in their supermarket stores. So they're spread throughout Moscow and also now to, to various other cities in Russia um, and now also going uh, abroad. And the interesting thing about them is that they also have um, 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 quite some hate for traditional hierarchies and traditional ways of working. So the people in the shops have almost all of the decision-making power that to, to, to make the decisions that will benefit their shop. And they run the shops as if they are separate companies. So the people working there, mostly in teams of five to 10 people, they really run their own shop and are, are part of this bigger network, but they feel very much the ownership and entrepreneurship of being uh, an entrepreneur themselves. And some of these elements uh, where, for example, they select their, their, their representatives or their leaders in the, in the team themselves. Uh, they have a lot of transparency on performance, on profitability, um, and, and all of these things as we see in other organizations as well. And there's another really cool example, a Chinese company called Hire. Um, and they have split up their big traditional organization, which involves a lot of manufacturing. So they're uh, the largest white goods manufacturer in the world, making washing machines and refrigerators and all that stuff. And they split up the big company of 80,000 people into more than 4,000 micro enterprises where people select their own leaders, set their own working hours, uh, make their own entrepreneurial decisions on their strategy, for example, and the people they're hiring and firing. And all of that is being done by the team themselves. As long as they are successful and profitable, they can also get the benefits from that. So there's a lot of profit sharing involved. They can even take shares in their smaller companies. So instead of having this big corporate organization where you need politics, where you need to move your way up the hierarchy to be able to influence what's going on, this organization is completely different because it's so decentralized. Um, and the people, whether you're in the, in, the, in, the, in the more strategic areas of the organization or at the bottom of the organization in working in one of these micro enterprises, all of them have a lot of decision-making power. So people feel as if they're working in a startup where they can influence what's going on and therefore be much more engaged and motivated as well with everything that's going on. So these are some of the, the examples of companies that are doing things differently, even in environments where you wouldn't expect, expect such a thing to happen. Um, and I think these are really cool examples to show to people that it can work, even in big companies, even in traditional environments such as manufacturing, even in a culture like a Chinese culture, where you also wouldn't expect such a thing to happen necessarily. Um, so I think there's, there's good uh, prospects that companies like these are adopting it and many organizations can learn from it, not to copy their way of working, but to learn from the principles behind them and see how they can adopt them in their own situation. So, so tell me the, the last topic of, of this video is, it is easy to work like this in a small team. Our team is trying to work like that and, and, and we love working like that, but what can an HR professional, let's say an HR director do, who has an existing company of 400 to 1,000 people, let's say? Uh, that's one question. The second part of the question is, who is the leader behind this transformation? Is it HR or is it the CEO or is it some kind of internal champion or, 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 or de it depends on who is taking the lead? What, what is your... Uh, view on this? Um, we've seen different approaches. We've seen the approach where the leadership of an organization makes a decision to change, sometimes making that decision very much top down and forces the organization to change. That doesn't happen too often. Um, sometimes the leadership makes the decision to change, but does it in a very collaborative way. So working with the organization to make the change. And even sometimes it comes from one specific team or one specific department where the leader of that team or leader of a department decides to do things differently. They start experimenting with the things that they can change in their own circle of influence. So maybe not the big things like changing the hierarchical structure or uh, changing the remuneration or the salaries, but maybe thinking about how to change decision-making in your departments or how to change career paths in your departments or um, how to create more transparency around what you're doing. 
And sometimes when it starts in one team or one department, it can then um, 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 go over to other teams or departments in the organization. And you can really create some kind of movement in the organization of change. And we've seen companies where a group of 20 people have changed the entire way of working of an organization of about 2000 people. So it really started with the team at the bottom of an organization working in a logistics department. And then they started to get more people and more teams involved. And they've been really able to create this change movement that, uh, that changed the entire way of working of this, of this bigger company. So it can come from various uh, ways. I think for HR people, it's important to find the pioneers in your organization. So as an HR director, you might not have the power to force an organization to change. So find the people that are interested in changing their way of working, show them how it can be done different, give them the opportunity to visit some of these organizations or at least to learn from them, and then go ahead and, and change or give them the freedom to make changes in their work environment. Start with the smaller things and then start changing the bigger things once you see the first success. So it's really about giving people the opportunity to change, to step forward, to make a transformation and start with the small things and then create the bigger changes as you go. Because I think everybody has the power to do that. Um, you don't have to be a leadership, have to be in a leadership position for that. So find those pioneers, give them the opportunity to change, set up experiments and then start slowly but surely start transforming the bigger things. Thank you very, very much for being here. That was an interesting uh, discussion. Thanks Thank for having me. Enjoyed being here. Uh, and, and we hope to see you more. Uh, and we definitely will be going to follow you and, uh, and share some of the Corporate Rebels stuff to the Hungarian HR community. Uh, and let's see uh, how the next few years uh, going to go. I think that's going to be, for us, at least for, for you and us, that's going to be an exciting thing to watch, isn't it? Yeah, exciting thing to watch and an exciting thing to influence as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's, a good, uh, that's a good end line. So thank you very much. Thanks for our audience and uh, take care all. Ciao, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.